Hyponatremia is a fairly common entity in pediatric clinical practice and everyone, especially residents, should be apt at diagnosing and managing the same. Sodium is the major cation in the extracellular fluid. The serum sodium levels normally are 135 to 145 milliequivalents per liter and hyponatremia is defined when serum sodium falls to less than 135 milliequivalents per liter. The types actually depend on the volume of the extracellular fluid. So hyponatremia can be hypovolemic hyponatremia, euvolemic or hypervolemic depending on the volume. Now hypovolemic hyponatremia in this, the sodium losses are more than the losses of water. Actually the water balance itself can be positive or negative but the losses in sodium are more than the losses of water. So it is seen in conditions like gastrointestinal loss like diarrhea or vomiting, renal losses or diuresis, third space losses for example which is seen in sepsis, peritonitis, bowel obstruction, cerebral salt wasting syndrome which is uncommon in children and is associated with CNS injury or lesions and mineralocorticoid deficiency for example Addison's disease and pituitary failure which are again uncommon in children. In euvolemic hyponatremia, <clears throat> there is no evidence of either volume depletion or volume overload. Rather, these patients have a slight excess of total body water and only a very slight decrease in total body sodium. It is seen in conditions like syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, antidiuretic hormone secretion, glucocorticoid deficiency, hypothyroidism and water intoxication which is seen in conditions that, for example, it can be iatrogenic in kids who are taking swimming lessons who gulp large amounts of water and in patients with psychogenic polydipsia. In hypervolemic hyponatremia, the increase in total body water is more than the increase in serum sodium, leading to relative hyponatremia. For example, in heart failure, hepatic failure, acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease and nephrotic syndrome. Remember one thing, in almost all the above conditions, there is a decrease in effective circulating blood volume, causing antidiuretic hormone secretion, which in turn causes water retention, and sodium is retained under the influence of aldosterone and other intradrenal mechanisms, but the net result is hyponatremia. Why? Because the retention of water is more than the retention of sodium. Now, there are three slightly confusing terms we must get ourselves clear about. Osmolarity is the concentration of solute in solution and is expressed as osmoles of solute per liter of solution. Osmolality on the other hand is concentration of solute expressed as total number of solutes per kilogram of solution. Normal serum osmolality is 285 to 295 milliosmoles per kg and what is important to know here that since it is the solute particles per kg of solution modification of water intake or excretion will not affect the plasma osmolality. Tonicity on the other hand is the osmotic pressure or the tension of a solution. Basically it is the osmotic force exerted across the membrane as influenced by the differing concentrations of solutes in and out of the cells. So the formula for calculation of serum osmolality is twice sodium ion plus glucose upon 18 plus blood urea nitrogen upon 2.8. In this formula, you must remember that it is only sodium and glucose which are effective osmoles. Effective osmoles are the osmoles which can cause fluid shift because of their concentration. Blood urea nitrogen on the other hand which is increased in renal failure, it is an ineffective osmole. It will not cause fluid shift from intracellular to extracellular or otherwise because of itself per se but this does not happen in the brain as we'll see later. Now the clinical features of hyponatremia now primarily depend on the decrease in serum osmolality. osmolarity. So early features are nausea, vomiting, anorexia, headache, muscle cramps and weakness while late features are altered sensorium, hallucinations, incontinence, kind strokes, breathing and seizures. Untreated the patient may land up in complications like extensor posturing, bradycardia, hyper or hypotension, dilated pupils, seizures and coma. Remember when serum sodium is low, water shifts from the extracellular to the intracellular space, causing cellular swelling and this is mainly problematic for the 
organ system of CNA that is the brain because it is confined within a fixed bony skull space. The diagnosis of hyponatremia obviously requires the determination of serum sodium ion but for etiology and management we may also need to determine serum plasma osmolality serum osmolarity because increased effective osmols for example glucose and mannitol can lead to pseudo hyponatremia that is sodium levels are normal but because other effective osmols like glucose and water are there water is retained in the extracellular fluid and there is a relative decrease in sodium ion so there is pseudo hyponatremia on the other hand if the osmolality is low then it is true hyponatremia then of course we need to clinically assess volume status whether it is depleted or overload because the management strategy changes and urine sodium ion urine sodium ion less than 10 is suggestive of extra renal causes of sodium loss whereas urine sodium more than 20 millimole per liter is suggestive of renal causes of sodium loss the management primarily depends on the pathophysiology and the specific etiology control of airway breathing circulation is the first and the foremost thing as we have seen in all the other cases hypoxia worsens cerebral edema and so does hyponatremia so pulse oximetry should be regularly done in these patients with hyponatremia also seizure control should be done with the first line anti-epileptics now the management is different for patient who is symptomatic or who is asymptomatic so in symptomatic patients we'll see the management further asymptomatic patients have subacute or insidious onset of hyponatremia in these patients the brain has already adapted that is cerebral edema does not develop since the brain cells maintain their volume by active depletion of intracellular solutes like sodium potassium chloride and amino acids to compensate for the hyponatremia present in the extracellular fluid also in hypovolemic hyponatremia the main aim is to replace the losses in hypervolemic hyponatremia the main aim is fluid restriction and diuretics this is the main treatment strategy vasopressin antagonists that is Baptins, they are useful for treating hypervolemic hyponatremia in cardiac failure but not in patients who already have moderate to severe CNS symptoms in isovolemic hyponatremia our aim is to eliminate the slight excess of water we had seen earlier rather children can spontaneously correct this kind of hyponatremia over 3 to 6 hours now treatment of the underlying cause is the most important one of the most important treatment strategies for example we need to do thyroid hormone replacement in patients with thyroid deficiency now management in symptomatic patient requires rapid correction with 3% hypotonic saline at the rate of 4 to 6 ml per kg followed by slow correction which I shall discuss next rapid correction is done to achieve a small rapid increase in serum sodium this rapidly increases the osmolality of the ECS of the extracellular space and water moves from a gradient of low to high osmolality that is from ICS to ECS remember each ml per kg of 3% hypotonic saline raises the serum sodium by approximately 1 milli equivalents per liter in asymptomatic patients rapid correction is not warranted why since these patients these patients have insidious or subacute onset hyponatremia and this may result in acute dehydration of the brain cells and cause severe and permanent neurological sequelae so what we need to do is a slow sodium ion correction now coming on to an example now for doing slow sodium ion correction we must make note of two things first first is the total fluid requirement depending on the age of the child that is what we calculate as per the holiday cigar formula 100 ml per kg for the first 10 kg then 50 ml per kg for the next 10 kg up to 20 kg and 20 ml per kg thereafter up to 28 kg also we need to know the composition of sod sodium composition of the commonly available IV fluids like normal saline or DNS have 154 milliequivalents per liter which comes to 0.15 meq per ml isop has 23 meq per liter or 0.02 meq per ml and 3 percent hypotonic saline has 512 MEQ per liter or 0.5 MEQ sodium ion per ml. So then the formula for correction is 0.6 into body weight into sodium deficit. 
do you know where this 0.6 comes from 0.6 is actually actually the total body water is 60% of the body weight of the child of a person so 0.6 is a factor which comes from this that is 60% of the body weight is water total body water now we calculate the sodium which needs to be replaced by this formula 0.6 into body weight into sodium ion deficit for calculation of sodium ion deficit we use the upper limit as 125 now suppose the sodium is 110 we will minus 125 minus 110 why do we take 125 because even though hyponatremia is defined as serum sodium less than 135 125 is taken as the upper limit for uh, correction why because a patient does not become symptomatic beyond that and usually the treatment of the underlying cause takes care of the remaining part so the amount which we calculate by this formula half of this needs to be replaced in the first eight hours and the other half needs to be replaced in the next 16 hours now what needs to be replaced in the next 16 hours is again divided into two one half of this needs to be replaced in the in the first eight hours of the 16 hours and the next and the last half uh, half remains to be given corrected within the last eight hours we must also remember that the rate of sodium correction should not be more than 12 meq in 24 hours that is 0.5 meq per hour rather the current edition of nelson says not more than 10 meq in 24 hours or more than 18 meq in 48 hours this is very important because Otherwise, a life-threatening complication can develop, which we'll see further. Also, frequent serum sodium monitoring is required, preferably point of care, that is bedside monitoring, which we can easily do with the help of a venous blood gas, but of course, it is costly. Now, suppose there is an asymptomatic child with a weight of 10 kgs and serum sodium 110 millimoles per liter. So, now we need to revise the two things which we had seen earlier in the earlier seat. The total fluid requirement for this child will be 1000 ml and we need to brush up our knowledge of serum sodium ion per ml. In NS or DNS it is 0.15 meq per ml, isop it is 0.02 and 3% HS it is 0.5 meq per ml. Now using the formula 0.6 into body weight into sodium deficit, what we calculate is 0.6 into 10 into 125 minus 110 which comes out to be 90 meq and this needs to be supplemented in 1000 ml. That is the TFR which we had calculated for the child. Now 50% of this, that is 45 MEQ, needs to be supplemented in the 50% of the TFR, that is 500 ml. Within the first 8 hours, suppose we start the correction from 10 AM, then we need to, our aim is to supplement this much from 10 AM up to 6 PM. And the composition which we can use is, we need to calculate depending on the concentrations of sodium which we know in different type of fluids. So if we give 250 ml dextrose normal saline, it will be 38 meq and 250 ml isop, it will be 6 meq. So approximately 500 ml of IV fluid in this duration, that is from 10 am to 6 pm, shall be able to supplement 44 meq of sodium to the child. Similarly, the remaining 45 meq in the next 16 hours that is from 6 pm to 10 am the next morning of this half that is approximately 23 meq to be precise it is it is 22.5 meq but we can take it as 23 meq which needs to be supplemented in 250 ml iv fluid over the next eight hours that is from 6 pm to 2 am in the night and this can be calculated or this can be uh, formulated by giving 150 ml of dns or ns that is 22.5 meq and 100 ml of isop that is 0 0.02 meq making it thereby 250 ml of uh, 23 meq of approximately 23 meq of sodium ion in 250 ml of iv fluid from 6 pm to 2 am and similarly the remaining 23 meq from 2 am to 10 am with the same composition i guess i have been able to clarify it how to make the sodium ion correction now one common mistake i have noticed here that residents are confused they think that they should not correct more than 12 meq in the 24 hours so in place of sodium deficit they will use the uh, number 12 which is wrong we need to calculate the entire amount of deficit which is present of in the sodium but the rate of correction the rate at which you must the body is correcting the sodium ion should not be more than 
12 mmq in 24 hours as we have already seen in the previous scene. Now a word about syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion which is a very important cause of hyponatremia. Now in this what happens is that there is excess of water with limited ability of the kidneys to excrete. The mainstay of therapy is fluid restriction with normal sodium ion intake, furosemide which promotes excretion of excess water and sodium chloride supplementation which counters the slight sodium loss secondary to it diuretics are the mainstay of therapy. The net result with this is an increase in sodium ion without an increase in blood pressure. Also oral vaptans for example tolvaptan can be used. Vaptans actually block the action of antidiuretic hormone and they cause diuresis. Thus they are helpful in treating uvolemic hyponatremia. Now osmotic demyelination syndrome. A term used more commonly these days is CPM or central pontine myelinolysis. Why? Because pon pons is one of the major organs affected although myelinolysis of extra pontine structures also occurs. Now this is a complication which is seen due to rapid correction of hyponatremia especially the insidious onset type. Now you would be coming to terms of as to why I am stressing that the rate of correction should not be more than 12 mq per 24 hours because if the rate exceeds this then the patient has a risk of developing central pontine myelinolysis or osmotic demyelination syndrome which can lead to permanent neurological sequelae. So basically it is a delayed neurological deterioration with symptom onset 1 to 4 days after the acute rise in serum sodium by more than 12 mq in 24 hours. And the symptoms and signs are confusion, agitation, placid or spastic quadriparesis and even sudden death. Remember this is so dangerous. However, this is rare in children and is common in cases with chronic hyponatremia or insidious onset hyponatremia especially if you correct them fast. And one can use desmopressin as an agent if you find that the sodium correction is occurring at a rate more than the desired rate. Note that if ever you are not sure whether hyponatremia is acute onset or a subacute onset, treat it as subacute onset to avoid the development of this one of the fatal complications. Now, pseudohyponatremia is a laboratory artifact in which serum sodium is actually normal but reflects to be low. It can be differentiated from true hyponatremia by a good clinical history lab examination and, the, of course, the measurement of serum osmolarity. Serum osmolality is normal to high in this condition but is never low unlike in true hyponatremia. Actually what happens is that osmotically active substances which we had already discussed earlier. Osmotically active substances like glucose, lipids, proteins, mannitol etc. They can cause movement of water out of the cells and thus reduce serum sodium by dilution. So actually serum sodium isn't low but appears to be due, appears to be so. So, pseudohyponatremia is in conditions like hyperglycemia, for example, in diabetic ketoacidosis, hypercholesterolemia or hyperlipidemia, mannitol use, and hypoproteinemia, for example, multiple myeloma, which is not seen in children. These patients do not have symptoms and signs of hyponatremia, so clinically also you can uh, differentiate, but you should be you should make yourself sure before reaching to a conclusion clinically. And the levels usually get corrected with the treatment of the underlying cause. Thank you so much for a patient watching and uh, I hope I am able to make myself clear. Please do share the knowledge. Thank you.